I'm Nina. I'm um, uh, a board member at the TDC, and I am incredibly happy to introduce and welcome Tim Brown, who, um, you know, I went back and looked up when that actually was that we first met in Munich. Um, the first, 2010, right? First ever web font day in Munich. Um, I was just an attendee. Uh, Tim was speaking, and we, we ended up chatting sort of on the sidelines of the conference, and I was reminded of that also multiple times actually when I read his book, which he's here to present. Um, because two things really struck me about uh, the, the conversations we had then and we've had since. Um, one of them is what we were also talking about before, um, that in talking with Tim, I just got very excited about this this fact that the web, which when I first got into contact with the web, it was this very kind of sad medium where you couldn't do much. Um, and then people got very excited and everything was very loud. And now it feels like there's this genuine, just forward thinking new discipline emerging that's actually pushing topography forward into places that print just doesn't go, uh, just by, by virtue of, of what it is. And, um, so Tim, I believe, it really is is one of these people who thinks about typography from from a web native standpoint, which I find incredibly exciting. Um, the other thing about Tim that just strikes me every time is that he's incredibly kind and he's incredibly generous with his knowledge. And both of these things, I think, make this book really outstanding. And I'm very happy he's here to present it. Please welcome Tim Brown. All right, hello everyone. Uh, so, thanks Nina for having me. Thanks, it's great to be here at the TDC. I, I love this place. I love uh, coming to workshops here. It's just a really nice environment and there's a lot of history to it. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you're all here with me. Uh, and thanks for having me. This is a, this is a, big, uh, this is a big deal for me uh, because I wrote this book. Um, I've been working on this book for, I had been writing it for three years, I've been thinking about these ideas for much longer than that, speaking about them for maybe 10 years. Um, the stuff that's in this book is not transient. This is my best ideas about the nature of the, the, the craft and, and the way that it's changing. Um, I just to give you a little background, uh, I, I'm, I'm a web designer. Nina was totally right that I come to this all from a, a, a web background. I studied graphic design in school. One of my teachers, Cliff Minter, is here. Uh, this is amazing. I haven't seen him since, since school. Um, I took bookbinding with Cliff, and, and just uh, awesome, awesome memories. Um, but I, you know, so I, I studied graphic design. I got a, sh a job at a print shop on campus just. Uh, while I was in school, Arthur Honer, uh, who still teaches at SUNY New Paltz, uh, hooked me up with that job. And then uh, I was learning about web stuff on my own at the same time. So I have this background where I studied design and I've been thinking about uh, web technologies for a long time. Uh, long story short, I joined a startup called Typekit, which was about uh, helping people use web fonts. We were acquired by Adobe, and now I'm called head of typography at Adobe. Um, I work with our product teams. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Adobe products. Uh, you'll, you'll know that they're very powerful, they're industry standard tools, but they're also very complicated, and there are little differences about the way that features exist across those different apps. Um, I'm working to help uh, make that all more consistent and to make it all better uh, and to incorporate some new tools that, I mean, I don't even understand what they will be yet. I'm hoping that you'll all help me. And the, the, the reason that, that um, I, I want this talk tonight, I, I know that the marketing materials that are about the book, and I'll, I'll talk through some of the concepts of the book, the core concepts, but really, I'm excited because I want to have a conversation tonight with you all. I mean, we have a great mix of people here. We've got students, we've got people who've been practicing in the industry for years and years. We've got people with print knowledge, you know, a sensitivity toward balance in design work. And folks who are comfortable on the web. And we all have experiences reading online. Uh, people carry devices. 
with them all the time. You know, ph phones, they have tablets, they have uh, e-reading devices, Kindles, right? They've got laptops of all different assortments, combination laptop and, and tablets, right? Uh, they've got, you know, there's, there's interactive screens on the walls. There's interactive projection technologies that are popping up. You've seen Brett Victor's Dynamic Land stuff. It's a, it's a classroom style environment out in San Francisco where there's, you know, uh, projections and you're kind of coding by laying paper out on the, t on the table. It's, it's amazing. Stuff is watching what you do and reacting to it with projection. That's a short hop away from actual projected digital experiences in our world. There's mixed reality gear. Right? This stuff seems gimmicky right now, but it's only a matter of time before that is ubiquitous. And so people are reading in different ways than they used to. My dad recently visited. He comes up several times a year, he lives in Texas, and, uh, and he always takes my girls out to Barnes & Noble when he's up with us. He likes to buy them books. So we're walking around Barnes & Noble and he's telling me about uh, a book that he was reading that he wanted me to read. So yeah, I'm listening and, and I said, in passing, I said, Dad, just out of curiosity, did you read that, a hard copy of that book or did you get an e-book? He, uh, he said, I like real books, but I, I usually go for the, I usually do it in iBooks, because then I can bump up the font size. <laughs> That's my dad's preference. And unlike his father, who used a magnifying glass, or you know, people who bought large format books, large, large print, or uh, reading glasses, wearing reading glasses, he's able to make the reading experience fit him. And that's very important to people. People expect devices to fit their preferences, to, to, to be customizable. This is especially important when you think about accessibility. Folks who are uh, visually impaired, motor impaired, whether that's a permanent thing or temporary, there, there's such a diversity of, of kinds of people and they're all important and they all have their own things that they like to do their own favorite devices and they mess around with the settings of those devices to get them just the way they like it What's really cool is look at all the different devices we have. Just like human beings, these devices are all different. They have different physical sizes, different resolutions. They have different uh, aspect ratios. Their brightness varies. Their text rendering varies. And so we have essentially an infinite set of variables that our work is perceived through. Now this chart here is just Android devices and it's from 2015. <laughs> the situation today is even more diverse and so when we talk about this stuff, we're really talking about, yeah, all this, but all future devices too. The text that you typeset today is going to live on even as this technology evolves. And it's not like readers have all this stuff, you know, like an individual is going to have a zillion of these devices that you need to plan for. It's that everybody has their own way of looking at a reading experience that matters to them. It's very personal. So, like I said, there's settings and preferences, right? You could have a, you could have a device, the same device as somebody else has, but your font size that you prefer is a little different, or you like to hold it a different way. 
maybe your contrast, you know, your screen brightness is set a certain way that, that you like. I like to keep, I drive my brother crazy, I keep my brightness real low to preserve battery life. And he's like, ah, oh, whenever he tries to look at my phone. Um, but, but so, you know, everybody, so even people with the same device can be different. iOS devices have a split screen view. So if you know the resolution of a device, somebody might be looking at the thing on that device, but in a, in a narrower context. So how do we design one experience that fits everybody? How do we do that? I think about this from a typographic perspective. That's my area of interest in all of ours, I think. And so traditionally, what do we do with a, with a text like this to, to typeset this? Well, we pick a font and we adjust the size and we pay attention to measure or line length and then we massage the line spacing. Right? These are the essential elements of a balanced text block and this is what we've always been doing with typesetting. You know, there's other details too, of course, but this is, this is the gist of it. You massage this text block, those properties, and you get it looking the way you want it to look. Well, here comes a reader. <laughs> and they're messaging their friends, and they're reading the news, and then they see the thing we made. Not many people have patience for this kind of reading experience. They opt out. If we're lucky, they switch on like Safari reader mode. That opts them out of all of the styling that we've put here. They're seeing it in a default font with you know measure and, and line spacing that Apple chose for whoever the device manufacturer is. People can homogenize this stuff. If it's not going to fit them, they'll make it fit them. Or they'll just leave. And you know what's really upsetting about this is that they don't blame us. They don't blame the device. They don't blame the website. They blame themselves. They feel really bad because they can't read text that's that small or whatever. My mother-in-law, I, I see her do it all the time. You know, she's got her phone with her. And, and she hangs out with our kids, and and if something's not going right on the phone, she just beats herself up about it. This has a real impact on people. And what if they actually wanted, which they probably did, to read what was there? They either have to put up with this, or, or they can't. And they encounter all sorts of uncomfortable types. And this is a this is an assortment of like anti patterns from the book. Right? You got text that's too tight or too loose, or too weak, or it's just dull because of the typeface that's been chosen, or it's kind of big and unwieldy. I don't like to point out live bad examples, but I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. You go to websites, there's, you know, you load one up on your phone when you're holding it vertically, and it's like three words per line, and the margins are humongous, because people think from a container's point of view when they're designing that stuff and the text suffers. So how do we design an experience that goes everywhere and fits everyone? These are the principles that I laid out uh, in the book, in chapter one, and the rest of the book is like practically applying these principles. But I'll, we'll talk a little bit about this uh, tonight. The, the, and, and also, like, I'm, I'm up here speaking, but this is, this is a sketch. This is me trying to understand what we're facing right now. Something that I meant to say at the beginning of this talk is that I think, like, I'll explain here how, how this, this is all looking from my perspective, but broadly, I think this is the biggest change. In, in graphic design history. 
in terms of what the decisions that, that designers are responsible for making and the impact that our decisions have on readers. There has never been a change like this before, as best I can reckon. And so, and, and we're in the middle of it. I haven't figured it out. We're figuring it out together tonight. You're all here with me. This is, this is going to be written about in books later, or <laughs> digital texts, right? Um, okay, so, so, uh, so, these, so these are the principles that I'm imagining. Uh, you have to work in a relative way. You have to measure your work relative to any given reader. You have to make multi-dimensional decisions instead of static ones. And you have to recognize that all of the design decisions we make, all of the presentational instructions, suggestions that we provide, are optional. Because of the nature of digital text, typography is less important than the data than the actual text itself. How it looks, uh, and, and we can talk all about this, but form literally follows function. Now, that's maybe good, but we might be losing some something in, in that. Um, and, you know, as designers, that's something that we need to be talking a lot more about. The meaning that presentational decisions provide in a designed experience is taking a back seat right now. We have to work really hard to make sure that people opt into that. Okay, so here's our same text block. We're going to do it up with these principles in mind. Uh, so one thing we can do is size this type relative to any given reader's default font size. That's very important. So here, instead of sizing type with pixels or points, which yields a situation like this, right? Fine for this person. This is great for them. This is the default font size they like. But this person's default font size is smaller, and this is too big for them. And over here, this person likes their type big, and this is too small. So we size type in a relative way. That way people who like small type get small text. People who like big, and, and this isn't a huge change. When you're thinking about code, this is a difference between using something like 16 pixels in your font sizing, in your CSS, versus this is, okay, 16 pixels, and now instead of typing in 16 pixels, you type in 1M, or 1REM, or 100%. All of those are relative units of measurement, and they will relate your type size to whatever the default font size is that the reader has. There are implications uh, for, for how this goes in the rest of your work, but I'll keep it real simple here. This is one thing you can do is use relative measurement. Another thing you can do is Think about something like measure in terms of limits, rather than a decision about how you know, long your lines of text are. Think about how narrow it can get, and how wide it can get, and still be acceptable to you. So you think about those limits, and then you also consider something like fluid line spacing. Right? If you have a narrow paragraph, this is like a traditional typographic best practice. right? Narrow text, tighten up the line spacing. Wider text, you loosen it up, gives people, you know, their eye a little bit more room to find the beginning of the next line. And so, when you set your limits about, you know, what the what the how wide or narrow the paragraph can get, you associate line spacing with those limits and allow it to flex in between. So, right, the traditional elements of a balanced text block here. And this is what we're doing. We've talked about relative measuring and multi-dimensional decision making. Instead of the static paragraph, you've got limits and flexibility. And then the other principle was optional. Right? 
So what happens when this typeface, for whatever reason, and there are a lot of reasons this can happen, this typeface isn't available to a reader? Maybe, the, uh, maybe they have a preference that doesn't want suggestions about fonts to use. They like their own font. Maybe their internet connection is slow and the file doesn't load, or their train goes into a tunnel. And we have to think about fallback fonts. This is a different font. This is uh, pointer gothic text. So a fallback for that might be Open Sans. It's a widely available sans. And if we've got a fallback in place, we're probably also going to want to adjust stuff about it so that it matches up, because right now it's a bit different than our intended typeface. And that, when you think about an entire composition, stuff can get really out of whack when a, when a different typeface is active. And so when you have fallbacks like this, you could try and match up their X heights to keep the, you know, the lines uh, sort of consistent. You could also think about copy fit. Usually it's a balance among those things where you're, you're matching up X heights so the type is sort of the same size and you're deciding to change the size or the width of the paragraph to keep the copy fitting the right way. You also have to think about typographic color. This stuff isn't going to match up exactly, but you do want to make some decisions about your backup situation. Variable fonts, if you've heard of those, I can talk more about those later if you haven't. Um, I can explain what they are and everything. Um, but essentially, those would be very interesting as fallbacks because you might be able to adjust properties to make the fallback match the intended typeface more closely. So really, this is, this is what we're talking about here. Um, so this is this is our traditional text block, and all this is with the principles applied. This, these are the decisions we're making. And now, here comes our reader, and they're looking at their text messages, and they're looking at the news, and instead of seeing this, they see this. That's amazing, because this is just this user. This stuff will look right no matter who's looking at it if we think about these principles as we're typesetting. Now, I'm simplifying a lot to explain these principles and, and um, to, to, to talk about the focus on people who are reading because that's important to internalize. Um, but when you, when you think about When you think about the implications of this, using these principles in your work and applying them to individual text blocks like that, when you think about doing that uh, more broadly in your entire work, uh, it, it can get a little overwhelming. So I just want to give you a sense of the scope of what we're talking about in terms of the compositional complexity and in terms of um, how complicated it can get when you're receiving information about a reader by knowing stuff about their device. Uh, and then after we talk a little bit about that complexity, uh, I'll talk about the state of the craft today, the sort of the tools that we have available and what people are doing with this information today and, uh, and how we can participate. So this is a little, this is a little visual aid. Imagine this, this, these properties of a balanced text block as this dot, right? This is, we're, we're typesetting a, a, a paragraph. That's what we do. We make decisions and we end up with a thing, a paragraph that is set in a way that we like. When I'm talking about relative design, multi-dimensional decision making, we're really, we're really what we're talking about is a range of potential paragraphs that are acceptable and fallbacks. So this is a little different than just the dot.
uh, in our text block, so let's say we've, let me go back a slide. So let's say we've got this, right? We've, we've made decisions about our text block and its limits. Our text block is going to be pushed beyond those limits, always. What happens when we've made a decision about how narrow our text block can, be, can get, but a viewport comes along that is even more narrow? This is what I, what is, this is what I call pressure. Um, I, I like that term because it feels like, you know, there's something happening to our text that we have to now relieve. There's, there's it's this, any sort of uh, uncomfortable reading experience can be thought about this way. And really, this means that we have to make more decisions as designers. What's going to happen when our text experiences this pressure? What are we going to do with this? What can we do? We can just let it happen. As long as we're making that decision consciously, I think it's okay. We can maybe reduce the font size so that more characters fit per line and the measure is a little more acceptable. But remember that that relative font size is very important. So if you start shrinking text as a result of pressure like this, you're getting away from that familiar default font size that each reader has. Maybe you do a mix of these two things. You reduce the font size a little bit and you let the measure be a little more narrow than you'd prefer. Or you switch to a condensed style of the typeface. That's an appealing solution. Um, some folks have tried that in the past, bless you, and, uh, and with mixed results. Because it was, uh, I believe Alyssa Part did Georgia and Georgia Condensed. And Georgia Condensed was a little too condensed. Readers were complaining about that, some folks. But variable fonts could be really interesting in a scenario like this. Variable fonts, just to explain them super briefly, imagine a family, a type family, with all of its variations, from light to bold, condensed to extended, a big family as one file, where instead of the regular being a separate font file from the bold, there's a bold axis for the regular style. So you can make it a little more bold or a little less bold a little more condensed or a little wider. You can massage that with much more granularity. So imagine that we can make this a little condensed and reduce the font size a little and allow the measure to be just a little more narrow than we'd prefer. Imagine that our variable font has an optical size axis. Right? For those of you who are familiar with optical sizes, that could make a smaller type size more acceptable to a reader who's used to their bigger size. So anyway, you, you can have all these responses to pressure. But essentially, and maybe we represent pressure like this in our, in our little visual aid. Essentially, it's another decision that we're making. It's not just this range. Now we have a condition and we're making a whole other set of decisions here. This, this can also be a range. There can be limits down here. Maybe after we reduce the font size in response to pressure, now we have a different you know, set of measure limits and line spacing. It compounds. And this is only if the text block gets more narrow. What if it gets wider? We have to make other decisions about pressure. And we probably want fallbacks in place when we're in those conditions as well. And this is just one text block. Compositions are full of different text blocks. And you might want different behaviors. Maybe your paragraph text is set to the reader default and flexes and rewraps as the, as the text block gets narrow or wide. Maybe your heading scales. Maybe your heading is real big and it scales down in size, but not too much because then it will get to too close to the size of the paragraph text, so you stop. You stop scaling the heading and you, then you make it wrap instead.
And, uh, and then compositionally, not only do you have all these individual text blocks and their flexibility, you have to think about relationships in the composition. Like the fact that that heading was getting small until it was getting too close in size to other headings or the paragraph text. Those decisions, those are decisions you make as a designer. You're thinking compositionally when you decide how individual objects flex. And what sorts of things do you think about as a whole composition and all of its constituent pieces are flexing? You think about maintaining alignment that matters to your composition. If stuff is flexing, you gotta make sure it lines up to produce the, you know, the graphic effect that you want. You have to think about a white space balance, right? If, you're, if your line heights are all tightening up, what are your margins looking like? That's related. Uh, you have to think about a, uh, oh, contrast, adjusting contrast, right? If you, if you have this experience, it's this broad, a, a large screen, and your compositions on that screen, there's a lot going on, and you need sufficient contrast to help guide a reader's eye, but if the experience is more focused, you don't need as much contrast that can be distracting in a really focused experience. So you, you, you think about that stuff, those are compositional issues that you manage in addition to thinking about individual text blocks. And mostly when we talk about flexibility, people's minds, and all of my examples here tonight, think, you know, you think about width, you think about the width of a viewport, but that's just one axis of evaluation, right? You have, you have height, you have aspect ratio, you have the screen coarseness, Right? You have how close a reader is to the screen. It can get very complex. But it will be fine. I am a volunteer firefighter. Um. But seriously, chapter five of my book is about those compositional adjustments, thinking about contrast and white space management. And chapter six is about relieving pressure. So once you have something that you've made some decisions about, evaluating it along a bunch of different axes, making notes, going back to adjust things. And the entire book is organized in a way that's reflexive, as Jason Santa Maria likes to say, right? It's a reflexive relationship between those small elements and big compositional decisions. So it's designed for you to go back through the chapters, fix something down here, and then progress back through all the compound decisions that are involved. So um, the rest of my slides are boring, but I'm going to talk a lot. So and it's kind of dark in here, but that's OK. Um, the the I want to talk a little bit now. So, so we've got an idea of the complexity. I'm not getting into code and everything tonight. I want to have a conversation with you all. If you want details about this, the book is available. If you can't afford it, I will send one to your library. Um, if, if, um, if there's stuff that you want to talk about specifically, practically, I'm happy to talk. You can email me. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more later tonight, too. But the state of the art right now is you know, with this information, you essentially have three choices. And people are making one of these choices whether or not they know it. Anybody who's designing for different screen sizes today and different conditions for readers to be in, they're either ignoring all this and just producing work without making all the decisions they need to make, and readers suffer. And that happens a lot. But we can't do that. We can't ignore this stuff because real people suffer. And I think that's a big reason why people ignore it. They just, they don't identify with all the people using their devices and all the different kinds of settings and preferences of people that are reading. They just don't think about them. And there are ways that we can improve that. Another thing that people do today is they have a team. There's designers who mock up static instances of a design, and then they work with developers to make it flex. And 
if you have a team of people, I mean, this is why uh, conversational design software is so popular these days, where you can have several people's cursors on the screen at once leaving comments about a design and, oh, change this, and oh, make this flex differently. It's because you need to talk about all these things and there's no, there's no way to articulate those design decisions up front. So you, you, these designers, they, 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 they have some static mock-ups and developers make them flex. Those conversations are a best case scenario. Sometimes the developer is just stuck making decisions about how stuff flexes. And they're frustrated, and the designer doesn't like how things turn out. Or maybe you don't have a team. Then what are you doing? It's really frustrating to try and do this stuff as an individual. But there are some people who can do it. The people who can do this kind of work really well, they know how to code. They know how to write HTML and CSS. But they're essentially working with their eyes closed. They have to code here and then look and see what's happening. And they know it well enough that they can kind of imagine how it's going to turn out. But it's still a blind experience. Code is where, code is where you're closest to the material of this flexible design. But it's, it's still not good enough. You can't, you can't see what you're doing. I mean, some of the some of the stuff that I that I showed earlier, these slides, right? Like, almost there, this, right? The actual code involved in making this happen. I wrote some. I can't read it. I can't even tell that if I adjust it a certain way, what the visual results are going to be. It's just a, it's just a long string of math. But I know what I want visually. I should be able to just do that. Oh, we're gonna have to wait for this. Sorry, everybody. Um, so, 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 code is is, is where you're closest, right? All right. <laughs> code is where you're closest. Um, design tools are totally inadequate for this work. I work for a company that makes mainstream design tools, and they're not good enough. Design tools don't let you set type in a relative way. They don't let you make flexible decisions about your work. I mean, some tools have responsive features where stuff is, is flexing, but it's all from the point of view of the container. The text suffers. So both, and, and, and also, also the, the code for making that dynamic line spacing, right? You can pull that off. But what's happening with that code is you're saying, not when this paragraph is narrow or wide, make its line spacing this or that. You're saying when the viewport is wide or narrow, make this paragraph. So it's, it's, you're, you're tying that flexibility to the only information you have right now, which is about the viewport. Even code does not give you the information you need about individual text objects. And forget about relationships among text objects. That doesn't happen. We have to define that in code and in design tools. And that starts with talking about what we'd like to see happen. Um, I'm hopeful that we can make this easier on ourselves. Right? This stuff feels complicated right now because we don't we don't have all the words we need to describe all the decisions that we're making. Part of the reason I wrote this book is to try out some new words. Um, And, and, and using those words, when we talk to each other about the work that we're doing, using new words, not just mine, is one of the most important things we can do. We can talk to each other. Maybe 
maybe those conversational design tools aren't so bad. But really, we have to figure out what it is that we want to be different about the way we're working. And so part of that is uh, talking to each other. Part of it is making examples and showing them to each other. Uh, teaching. Teaching is very important. Understanding uh, core principles of typeset is critical. It's, it's, that stuff is more important now than it has ever been because, because there are so many variables in reading experiences. We can't count on the dimensions, the format of the work anymore. We can't count on a standard reading distance. Whereas before we made physical objects, we sort of knew how far away people would be from them. You just can't know that. But everybody has a default font size. That's our rock. You design experiences outward from that, whatever it is. And everything else is a variable. So those, those principles, the principles I laid out also, but just general good typesetting practices, that trickles upward throughout an experience in a powerful way. And so we need to make that part of what we teach. Uh, I mean, strengthen it. Oh, um, and, and teaching, when I, when I talk about teaching, I'm, I'm not just talking about classrooms. I'm talking about teaching each other. I'm talking about sharing what we learn having uh, experiments that you put publicly and show to other people and talk about with other people. Um, this is, participate in web standards is on my list here because that's how you make improvements in code. Uh, Jeff Veen likes to say that web standards are built on rough consensus and running code. Put an example together, talk about it with other people, figure out whether this is really the behavior that you want, and then it gets standardized. Um, Jason, I don't want to pick on you here, but I don't, I, you, you have been doing work recently, this Jason Plamental here, um, he's been doing work recently uh, to talk with, uh, you, you've been doing work for, for caniuse.com, thinking about like how to contribute there in terms of like features that are supported. That, that, that website is about what CSS works in which browsers. And it's based on people checking and contributing. Uh, and, and you need to know that sort of stuff to know what works where and what's experimental. Uh, Jason, you've also put together uh, uh, test cases and contributed to the um, the you know web standards or uh, GitHub right GitHub repository you can c contribute issues we've talked about variable fonts this idea of dynamic line spacing that's essentially a way of putting rules around flexibility that's useful in more contexts right so this is stuff that we can get browser makers to think about to talk about to build into their their tools and um, and and talking to tool makers as well I mean people who design software they're listening people who design typefaces are listening they want to know what we want right yeah. Um, here oh, yeah, got it, sorry I don't want to derail it but I it's one of the things that I try and stress the most with students and at conferences is that we have a voice, more so than any time in, in history, I think, to be able to talk to people that make browsers and talk to people that make web standards about what's important in design and what's important in type, because they don't know. And so when you actually speak up and, and send an email or, or file an issue on a website, uh, people are incredibly receptive. And, and there, I think, has been more progress in the state of what we can do typographically on the web just in the last year or two because of that level of conversation than any point in the history of the web. 
and, and that's pretty remarkable. And uh, designers may not be used to working in that way, but developers are. Hmm. And we have to adopt that if we want to have a voice in, in how this stuff works. Thank you. Thank you. And, and similarly, um, design tool makers are listening, as I mentioned a minute ago. Like, one, one of my goals for having written this book is, I work at Adobe, but it's a big company. And it's hard to know what all everybody's doing. And like they're all talented, nice people working on stuff. But I'm trying to get their attention because I'm sensing this big shift in the actual nature of the work we do. And I wrote this book in part to get their attention. It's working. I'm talking to a lot of people that I wasn't talking to before. And they are eager to know about this. They're eager to hear from the community. Once I started paying more attention to actually how they make decisions, they've got user forums. They take ideas about features that we want to see in tools. I'm working on stuff right now to, to bring consistency to all of the tools that we offer. So, you know, I'm hopeful that we can contribute to the sorts of tools that will make all of this decision making just natural for us so that more people can do it and you don't have to bury yourself in code or have a team of people behind you to actually produce stuff that fits everyone. Ah, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about some of the stuff uh, that I'm doing at Adobe. Just Briefly, um, uh, I'm working on refinement tools for better typesetting controls in general. We have good tools, but they can be better. We can also work in uh, broad strokes. Uh, there's a, there's a, you know, this this idea of a paragraph being tighter or looser. There's a lot of stuff you're adjusting about a paragraph to make it look good in those scenarios. And uh, Cyrus Highsmith wrote a book called Inside Paragraphs. This is a fantastic book about balance in text. And uh, he, he has this idea of tempo where, you know, narrow paragraphs, you tighten up the tempo. You're, you're tightening up all the little white spaces, not just not just line spacing, but you're, you're thinking about uh, a faster, tempo for that narrow paragraph and a, loop and a slower tempo for a nice wide paragraph. So what, I mean, what if we were able to control several features with a broad stroke and deal with the tempo of a paragraph or a composition and then drill down into the details if we want to, but like make some of that a little easier on ourselves and, and th do our work in, in uh, more comfortable terms, right? It's it's all about the details, but you should be able to handle many of those details simultaneously in a way that works for you. You should be able to personalize this stuff as well. So it's not like the same default tempo adjustment for everybody. You have your way of working, your settings, and you, you can do that. Um, there's uh, something called Adobe Sensei, which is our magical sounding word for machine learning. Um, and I'm working a lot with those folks and they have the right idea. They have uh, ideas about uh, not making uh, artificial intelligence like Clippy. It's making it more, right, making it more useful, uh, tactful. And, uh, and I think that one of the things that they can be doing is helping to personalize those experiences and also um, offering us ways to quickly get a different look and feel for the work that we're doing by looking at things that exist and remixing our own work to try and take it in different visual directions broadly before we get down to business and refine stuff. So thinking about that, um, thinking about um, making our own tools, right? Uh, I talked with a guy, um, Patrick Hebron, who thinks a lot about what machine learning can do for um,
designers to enable them to make their own design tools. So let me give you a quick example. Variable fonts. I'm, I'm really sorry if you didn't know about variable fonts before tonight because I'm talking about them a lot and I haven't explained them properly. But the example I gave before about a font being bold or condensed, you know, those are standard axes, but a variable font can really be open-ended. You can have a splatter axis that controls the amount that a display face, you know, gets splattery or whatever. You can make up axes like this. And so what does the control for that look like? You can have sliders for every different feature of a crazy font. That's a lot of sliders. That's kind of not very intuitive for managing the creativity that's baked into that font. Maybe the type designer should have some input about what sorts of controls are presented with their typeface. Maybe you as the user like a certain kind of control for manipulating variable fonts, dealing with your typesetting. Why don't we give you that kind of control? Why don't we help you customize your tool so that you're sort of making decisions about your own setup? And that, I mean, tools have that right now. There's different sets of palettes you can enable and you can personalize that. So, so I'm just I'm looking to move more in that direction. Uh, anyway, that's all I have tonight. I'll, I'll say, uh, you know, briefly that we we have we have power to shape the future of reading experiences, and 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 we are the people. This this is the time in history where we're going to decide what it is to practice typography, what it is to design, because this is such a core piece of what digital design is and how it fits people. It's going to make a huge difference to all kinds of people and their reading experiences and their daily lives. So it's really, it's, it's really cool that we can come here tonight as, you know, with all the different specialties and backgrounds and our level of, of, of experience in our careers and figure this out together. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to talk about all this. I can skip back if those slides were useful at all. Um, I would love to talk about any sort of typographic tools things that you're frustrated with about Adobe software is fine. Uh, because I know there's a lot of that, that's fine. Uh, what else, what else? Um, accessibility and just you know handling all these different conditions that people bring. This is a, this is a big, this is a big uh, open-ended time. I mean, how are, how, are you, how are you doing your work today? What, what sort of tools do you use? What, you know, when you think about approaching designing a digital experience, where do you begin? I mean, my, the process that I lay out in this book starts with text and then applies a font and then, you know, and, and the, the, the situation starts out very, rough, very simple, it's just a column of text, and you grow outward from there. That's generally how I work, but I know it's not how a lot of other people work. I have a sketch that I begin my work with of what I sort of want the composition to get to be like, and I work towards that from the, from the very you know, limited experience. I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about your your notion of contrast and and the different elements on the page and and what they need to react to. Yeah. Yes, happy to talk more about that. Um, so I think that let's see, what's a good? Maybe I have something in here that we can talk. Let me just pull up this. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wait. 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 <laughs> We're not going to wait for this. Here. We'll just talk about this. I know this is book pages. <laughs> But let's just imagine here that we have a composition with a, with a big uh, display area and a big heading. And we've got some text down below. 
So let's say that this, uh, let's say that, here, this is a better one because it's a longer word, right? Let's say that this page is getting more narrow. What are we going to do here? This word is going to start to get crunched. We have to do something. Probably we can scale this down a little bit. But this text, if that's a good size for reading, we don't want to mess around with that. We want this paragraph to get more narrow down here. And so the stuff I'm thinking about is, is this powerful enough of a heading if it's getting smaller? Are the white spaces here feeling too big for the white spaces in here? And what is this? Energy white space, uh, contrast. So, so Jason, you asked about contrast. Some other stuff that you could think about is, actually, let me pull up the book here. I buy books. Right? Mm -hmm. Where are we at? Compositions. Okay. This is looking a little small. Let's pull up the font size. <laughs> okay, so um, rat hole, yeah. So changing font size, right? That's that's I'm not gonna get on that. Uh Aha, uh -huh. okay. Definitely in this yeah, definitely. So, so, right. So, you're thinking about hierarchy. And so, when you have an experience that is roomy, like here, let me just pull up. Uh, oh, jeez, how many Sephora windows did I have? <laughs> Oh, no. I never got on the Wi-Fi. Okay, okay. I'm just going to describe it. No, no, no. Thank you, though. It's too long. Um, okay, okay. So I'll describe it. So imagine we've got a composition here. We've got a, a big heading here. We've got a smaller heading here. We've got some text. We've got a navigation-ish kind of small chunks of text here, each with their own little heading. It's important to have that variety in our heading sizes for contrast, for compositional contrast. You want some stuff to be big and a lot of stuff to be a sort of standard, normal size because the big stuff will help somebody's eye get around the composition. But if we're talking about a very focused experience, like on your phone, where you're only seeing a little bit of this big composition, having such a difference in your big heading and your small heading and your text, it's jarring in that focused experience. The big text looks too big for the little, you know, context. And as you're scrolling, the amount of room that's around those big pieces of text, the margins that you have set on them, the line spacing, it just feels, you know, unbalanced. You have to reduce that a little bit. And so you gradually do that. It's not like you, you jump from this low contrast, focused experience to this high contrast, big experience. You're, you're managing that contrast as the entire composition flexes. Um, this is, I think this is part of what design tools really lack, uh, is that they don't help you see from the perspective of all those contexts as you're making some decisions. When you're deciding how big this heading is, you should be thinking about not just the context of whatever screen you've got in front of you, but what are all the you know what are all the ways that this thing could exist? I imagine sometimes um, you know let's this is so hypothetical, but let's just think about it for a minute. Let's say you've got Apple glasses five years from now, ten years from now. It's got a little AR experience in the glasses. It projects on your lenses. So you're able to just, you know, and they're your regular prescription glasses, let's say, and you're working at the computer, and you're making a decision about a, a, a piece of type, typesetting. 
What if you could just sort of look up and see that same piece of typesetting in a bunch of different conditions? Just glance at what you're doing and then get back and change a couple things. Maybe you're adjusting stuff up here and watching all of its effects. Like, or maybe it's not uh, an immersive experience like that. Maybe it's uh, as quiet as experiences are today and, it, and you're focused on one state of the thing, but you have this way of being notified about possible pressures in other parts of the experience. I got way off topic from this contrast thing, but I mean, it's all, it's all sort of related, you know? Um, so, 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 so what else? So, you know, if, if, uh, if, if you're going to sit down tomorrow and try to make something, to, to take an experience that you've designed already, maybe, and think about how it would flex if it were in a different context, what sort of stuff would you do? Right? In chapter six of the book, I have this, uh, this, this way of, of evaluating a work. I, I recommend this spreadsheet where you just take the work and you put it in some conditions and you write down what you see. And you make a note of all the things that are wrong. And then you adjust it a little bit more, write down some more stuff. Get a feel for looking at the work in a bunch of different ways. And that'll help you figure out, like, you, you get to a point where you won't have as many problems if you're thinking about all that stuff up front. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm rambling. I can talk about this stuff literally for three years. I was writing this book. Um, so anyway, does anybody have any more questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so this actually continues on from what you were just saying. Um, it reminds me a bit of like making a typeface that exists in a design space, um, which has a similar, I imagine this has a similar kind of problem where um, what do you actually look at when you evaluate it? Like, um, do you have, do you weigh this in favor of what, you know, are common experiences? And then you add sort of the, the, the extremes of the design space. Um, but like when, when do you decide that you've kind of seen enough of this, of this potentially limitless thing that you're building to make a decision about when it's, you know, when it's, when it's done, for lack of a better word? Yeah, so that's that's a great question, and I think there are, I mean, off the top of my head, there's two ways to handle this. One is you base your decisions on statistics that you have, on, on readers that you care about. So you, you might have a website, you have statistics about sorts of devices that people come to that with, and so you, may, you prioritize your decisions based on what actually matters for your project. And the other approach is philosophical. What I'm, you know, when I talk about fallback fonts here, um, that's, that's, and fallback typesetting, this is not something anybody does. I mean, very, very few people not only do a good job of typesetting their main stuff, but then their backup situation. Well, you're the only one, the other one that I've met. <laughs> so, but, 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 like, Ray, you, you, you were telling me earlier today, you know, there was some, some what was that phrase uh, about uh, how many people encounter your website with JavaScript on or off? How did it go? Do you remember? It's like, what's, what's the percentage of people who come to your website with JavaScript off? 100%. All of them. The, web, the JavaScript is off for every reader until it loads. Right? And so fonts, fonts are files that get loaded into your design experience. Nobody has the intended font that you're putting forth. Or, you know, maybe somebody has it locally installed, but whatever, whatever. that's a de detail. People don't have that until it comes through, and there are a lot of reasons why it couldn't come through. So philosophically, when you think about all the variations of an experience, you could prioritize the default. Right, the thing that the the 
I would say that for a typeface, you could think about the Ribby variations as a default, right? Regular italic, bold, bold italic, these are things in word processors. If nothing else, those would work for a type family. So maybe if it's a more expressive face, you know, key variations that provide a glimpse into different kinds of expression that the typeface offers are the things to prioritize. Um, I think there's another question. I'm not going to be able to reach you at the mic. Would you mind coming up? No problem. So, right. All right. So, I'm actually really curious about this from a design educator's perspective yeah. because I feel so. I specifically teach typography at the introductory and intermediate level, and I feel like this should be incorporated in that. This should not be something added on to existing yeah. curricula. It should be built into the beginning of it. Yeah. Do you know of anybody who's trying this? Like, your book has been out for a few months, but obviously, you and other people have been thinking about this for quite a while. Do you know of any examples where people have tried to build this into these kinds of curricula? Uh, I thank you very much uh, for suggesting that this should be part of school curriculums because that was another of my goals. And I haven't um, done the legwork yet to reach out to many educators, uh, but I have some names and I'll try to uh, make sure that, that people hear about it. Um, I am speaking later this month uh, remotely to um, uh, campus in Utica, Pratt, Pratt's uh, campus in Utica, asked me to speak, so I know they're aware of it. SUNY New Paltz, of course, is aware of it. Amy Papalius there is right on top of things. Um, uh, Type Thursday, Thomas Jockin, who's here, the first Thursday of every month. Um, he teaches, and he was, you know, he quickly read the book and said, this is what I teach, and this is this is great, so I was very happy to hear that as well. He's a smart guy. Um, Jason, you wanted to add something? Uh, well, Laura friends at UMass Durham. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, have, they actually have classes specifically in web typography. Oh, yeah. 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 So, 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 so let me follow up on that a little bit. Sure, because, sure. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're recording, right? So you're yeah, on the mic. Okay. So, so the follow-up to that is that it's really great that it's happening like at some point. But I feel like it should be folded into the actual type courses rather than layered on afterwards. Like first you learn type and then, okay, when we get around to interactive, then we finally you know, do the other stuff. Like all of this stuff is really basic typographical concepts. It's just slightly applied differently and it should be built in right from the beginning. And so that's kind of what I'm interested in. So. We, we wouldn't argue with that. That's, yeah. that's, okay. I love this idea. Right? That, that's, this is why I'm, I've been feeling like this is such a momentous period in time, it's because it's not something that you're adding on to an experience. This is rethinking the core stuff, but it's not like discarding our heritage. It's, 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 it's riffing on that. It's building on it. It's evolving what we've always been doing. And, um, and I think it should be part of curricula. I also think that the angle that I presented this from tonight, which is an angle of accessibility and human reading experiences, is really important. Because people, designers, they don't think about human beings who experience their work as much as they should. They think about making design decisions that are good, quote unquote good, beautiful. And that's important. It's important to, de to develop a sense of taste and, and uh, skill in producing things that are formally pleasing. But it's not as important as making sure that information is available for people in the ways that they need it. So I think that those curricula that teach typography, I think you know, uh, programs about digital design in general, I think they need to uh, reorient themselves and concentrate more on accessibility across the board. I mean, that's, that's really, you, you talk to people, we, I was having lunch with some friends this, morning, this afternoon, this came up, right? It's, it's that when you're talking about UX design or interactive design, these are interesting subjects. And then you, you start to talk to somebody about web design and how interesting that is, and they're just bored. <laughs> this is all confusing. We don't want to make web design tools and everybody just codes. We don't want to do this 
CSS because we just use a design tool. We want to be visual people, right? But if you think about the web as an accessible medium, a medium that works for everybody by default and only doesn't work for them if you break it, that changes things. I mean, I, I, seriously, I love being at Adobe. I think we have a lot of potential. The folks I have talked with are very focused on app development and they don't like to talk about web design specifically. Those same people held a design conference. I went to the Adobe Design Summit. It's an internal conference this summer. It was phenomenal. And an entire day of the three days was devoted to accessibility. We had people come up there. We have a head of accessibility. This guy brought disabled folks on stage, people with cognitive disabilities. They talked about their experiences and the frustrations that they have. And we thought about that as a company in terms of how we structure our tools so that people can be creative with our tools regardless of their abilities. We also have to think about the users of the stuff that those people make. And the web is the answer to that. And you can talk about it as digital text, it's fine. It doesn't have to be web specific, but the, the, the philosophy of the web is very interesting as a model for thinking about all that. All right, I think we'll end there. Thank you very much.